Well, good morning to everybody. You know what I love about Rick is that uh, he loves the Lord Jesus and he has the joy of the Lord in him. This guy was in Columbus yesterday. He was at the game yesterday, as you probably are aware of that, and yet coming in this morning, get a big hug, and it, it, it hurt him a little bit to smile at me, but he did smile at me. But this guy has the joy of the Lord. I tell you, there's a lot of people that worship their sports teams. I mean, that's almost their God, and uh, their whole happiness is based upon how their teams do. That's why Detroit fans are perpetually sad, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it just, I, I admire that, that about you, Rick, and it's obvious that he has higher priorities in life than his sports team. Amen to that? Amen. <clears throat> well, growing up in the 1960s, I wasn't too impressed with the church. In fact, I thought the Lord had a pretty ugly bride. The reason? There appeared to be a huge gap between what the church proclaimed and how they actually lived. I'd read about the love and mission of Jesus, but I'd see divided, judgmental churches that seem more focused on serving themselves than serving the world. Now, as I've gotten older, I've grown to love the church. I think when I was younger, my idealism had blinded me to my own imperfections, first of all, and secondly, to the real beauty of the church and its positive place in God's kingdom. I would say that my skeptical idealism was replaced by positive realism and a better understanding of how God works through imperfect people to accomplish his mission on earth. But when I think of the church today, I think that sometimes we make things way too complicated. We get so involved with the business of the church, we forget the business of the church. The work of the church is to produce and prepare kingdom people. That's it. John Nugent, a professor at Great Lakes Christian College, suggests that the church was created to be the model home of God's kingdom. I think that's a great picture. You see, when home construction companies build a subdivision, they usually build model homes to show what living in that community, what it would be like. And they invite people to walk through them to see if this is where they want to live. The church is the model home of God's kingdom. Now, I want you to think about that a little bit and the implications of that. It's a little scary, right? And we can have a long discussion about what that statement really means for us. But for today, let's focus on one question. When the world looks at the church, perhaps this church, what are they seeing? Understand, they think they are seeing God's model home. They think they are seeing what God's neighborhood looks like. So the question needs to be asked is this, what kind of model home are we? And does anybody want to move in? The answer to these questions depend on whether God's neighborhood houses kingdom people. Now we've been going through a series of messages based upon the book Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. It's probably one of the most important books that's been written in the last 30 years. It's really helped the church, really helped Christians to understand who they are and who God is in their life. It's a great book. The book set out to explain the principles about knowing and doing the will of God. Now, we're almost to the end of the series where the author shifts from focusing on one's individual engagement with God to the corporate experience. Now, the individual's response to God's love and mercy is at center stage. But within the context of living in community with others of like precious faith. You see, when you accept Christ into your life, God's intention is to bring you into a relationship with a local fellowship of believers. The church is God's plan for his kingdom on earth. His plan is to plant kingdom neighborhoods all over the earth that are full of kingdom people 
whose desire is to follow the example and teachings of King Jesus. So the question has to be, what would that kind of church look like? And a close follow-up question would be, so what does it mean to be kingdom people? In recent years, I've been struck by the importance of a single verse of scripture that's tucked away at the end of one of the Apostle John's letters. It's found in 1 John 5, 19. I think we're gonna have it on the screen here. And this verse is important because it describes, I believe, in one verse, the truth of who we are as kingdom's people and what we're called to do. It helps us as the church to understand what it means to be the model home of God's kingdom. 1 John 5, 19 says this. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. I don't know about you, but when you read scripture and you read it over and over and over again and uh, you, you catch certain insights in, in certain things that God is trying to teach you. And 1 John is one of my favorite books in the New Testament. And as I was reading through it, I, you know, I've read this verse of scripture many, many, many times. But there's times that the Holy Spirit says, hold on. Hold on, I want you to read that verse again. <laughs> I want you to see there's a deeper meaning here for you. And this was one of those verses several years ago that God stopped me in my tracks and said, Larry, I want you to really think deeply about this one verse of scripture. And it has intrigued me ever since. Here we have John writing near the end of the first century. And, and he sends a circular letter from the Ephesian church to the other congregations in Asia Minor, and ultimately to all Christians throughout the ages, to you and me. It seems though, what's fascinating to me is that even in John's day, even in John's day, churches were wrestling with questions of belief, the nature of church leadership, and even mission. And, and here we are just 60 years 60 years from the time that Jesus walked the earth. And here they were already dividing as to the nature and work of the church. So John is writing to the churches to help them understand what God has called them to be. And as he nears the end of his letter, he comes, I believe, to the heart of the matter. When it's all been said, when you come down to it, John is saying, here's what we're talking about. We know we are children of God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Let's check out the first part of that verse. <laughs> it's a wild statement. We know we are the children of God. What an incredible statement. John said earlier in the same letter in 1 John 3, 1, here's, here's how he puts it there. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, exclamation point. Our reaction to the truth of that is so important in just being kingdom people. We should rejoice always knowing that we are a part of God's family, that we can experience life in all its fullness. The worship service this morning just fits so well into what we're talking about today. Rollo May, an American existential psychologist and not a Christian at all, has suggested that we are all born with two main drives or motivators in life. They are aspiration and affiliation. I really like those thoughts. They're aspiration and affiliation. Aspiration, he says, has to do with achievement. Affiliation has to do with belonging. When we are God's children, our aspirations don't end with the grave. The grave doesn't define us. It doesn't bury all of our achievements and accomplishments under the dirt of ultimate oblivion. Everything we do because we are God's children will in a real sense last forever. Also, when we are God's children, the question of affiliation, of belonging is answered forever. We will never be alone here or in the hereafter. My father-in-law uh, passed away in 1999 of stomach cancer. He was a real strong Christian man, was a deacon in the church, loved Jesus. At the end of his life, he wanted to be home. He didn't want to have any drugs in his system, 
Didn't want to have any painkillers, morphine. He wanted to be alert and bright to the moment he breathed his last. He endured the pain because he wanted to be in the present moment with his family. And as he was lying in his bed up in the upstairs bedroom, and my, my wife was there, my, my daughter Jill, who was 19 at the time, of course, uh, my, my wife's brother, some elders, some members of the church, and, and of course, my father-in-law's wife, my mother-in-law, Margaret. And he's lying there, and he's, he's talking. He's talking about how much he loves everybody in that room. He wanted them to know that right at the end. And then he started to fade away. And when he was, he would kind of close his eyes and go to sleep. And when he was uh, asleep, uh, he would raise his hand like this and was up in the air waving. And then when he kind of opened his eyes, it would drop. And he was so tired and emaciated, he couldn't even take a wet cloth, wet cloth to wipe, wipe his lips. He was so tired. And he was talking. And as he was talking, he kept quieter and quieter. And right at the end, <clears throat> he was talking, but he was talking so uh, quietly, uh, that Judy's mom went next to the bed and said, Tom, are you still talking to us or who are you talking to? He says, no, I'm talking to Jesus. And she said, can you see him? And he said, oh yes, and he's beautiful. And he died. Now my daughter who was in the room at the time said, dad, that was my worst moment in my life and my best moment in life. She said, you could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit so much, you could cut it with a knife. That's how she described it. That's the death of a Christian. At his death, he was surrounded by his biological and his spiritual family. At his death, he passed into the arms of Jesus. This is what it means to be children of God. Whether we are in this world or the next, we exist in a fellowship with others that's going to last forever. The world should see the joy and confidence that belongs to, belongs to kingdom people. When we come together and celebrate and share this love that we have with Jesus and to know that not only all our aspirations are with him, our affiliation is with him and they last forever. When I was a pastor of a church in the Grand Rapids area, I usually went to the same drugstore to get a prescription. And as a result, I became acquainted with the lady at the cash register. Now, she was not a Christian, but I always took the opportunity to encourage her to come to church. Well, after several failed attempts, she told me why she wasn't interested. It seems that Sundays, right after church, are the worst time to deal with customers. She told me that churchgoers, right after services, are the grumpiest, most demanding people she has to deal with all week. She said this, if that is what going to church does to a person, why would I want to go? Yow. I, I didn't ask her, is anybody from my church? I didn't no. ask her that. <laughs> I, I didn't ask that. But what, what an indictment, folks. People know who we are. I mean, they sense there's something different about us and we should be living with a joy that has no end. Kingdom people understand who they are and live like it, amen? We need to be full of life and love life. Uh, when I was a teenager riding with my dad, he asked me a question. Now you have to understand my dad, old school type of guy, uh, shake hands kind of guy. The only time I ever had a hug from my dad was after my mom passed away and I first saw him and he gave me a hug. That's the first and only time I ever had a hug from my dad. All right? Just one of those handshakes. How you doing, son? Right. You know, very quiet man, very brilliant guy. But when you're in the car, it's silence. No radio, no conversation. It's getting from point A to point B as fast as possible. Anybody, anybody, nobody, anybody like that? I think you might know somebody like that. Anyway, so we're driving in the car. I'm sitting in the passenger side, and he looks at me. I'm 18 years old. I'm 18. He looks at me and said, son, yes. He said, do you know who you are? Now, no preamble, no discussion, just do you know who you are? And I said, yes, I'm a carter, and I'm a Christian. And he said, 
Good answer. And we drove on. That was the total, <laughs> total conversation I had with my dad. But he understood and I understand what that answer meant. You see, that answer defined me then. And you know what? It, it defines me now. I know what it means to be a carter. I mean, he drilled it into us. This is what carters live like. This is who we are as people. Uh, this is how we react to people. And, and we've done genealogical studies, and we found out we have a rich heritage of faith going back over 500 years, the Carters have been Christians. So I know what it is to be a Carter. I know what it is to be a Christian. And you know what? There's a comfort and a strength that comes from knowing who you are. We know we are the children of God. So we need to be the most satisfied, confident, joy-filled people on the face of the earth. If we truly believe that and live like it, our worship would be always dynamic, our service would be done with all our hearts, and our impact on people would be indelible. But some people take the first part of this verse the wrong way. They understand that they are part of God's family, but they think that they've been allowed into an exclusive club that's only for the privileged few. That somehow God has chosen them and not a whole host of others to be children of God. And sometimes our theology messes that up a little bit, folks. I hate to say it. I was in West Michigan for a long time, and if you know anything about West Michigan, there's a certain theology that it's a very exclusive club you belong to. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Still others think that because God is our dad, there are certain things that come with being his kid. When my oldest boy, Jason, was 16, he said, Dad, I need to have a conversation with you. I said, sure. And by the way, he said that, Dad, I need to have a conversation with you. That wasn't our typical conversation. He said, well, let's go into the living room and sit down. And I don't want you to say anything. Okay. So when I, what's, what's this announcement going to be? What's he going to talk about? He started by saying, and parents, you've probably heard this before, maybe from your own children, Dad, I didn't ask to be born. Okay, you decided to have me. I didn't ask to be born. So because you had me, you must have in your mind thought that I need to provide for my children. So I'm abbreviating this conversation and I'm putting it in three C's. He didn't put it this way, but this is what he meant. So dad, because you had me, you owe me car, cash, and college. That's what he said. <laughs> Anybody reflect on that at all kind of way? Okay, all right. You owe me car cash and college. I, I disabused him of that no notion, by the way. <laughs> but folks, sometimes we treat God the same way. We, we say, well, God, you know, because I came to you, because I gave my life to you, and now, hey, I expect all the blessings that come my way. You owe me car cash and college, God. What our Heavenly Father gives to us is our identity. He gives us His love, His grace, His mercy. He gives us purpose and comfort and guidance and an eternal home. He gives us all those things that money cannot buy. So we need to be joy-filled people. We need to celebrate. But as far as I can tell, there isn't a period at the end of that first phrase. There's a comma. The comma means there's a continued thought here. The rest of the statement indicates where our focus as kingdom people need to be. And the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So yes, we need to celebrate our position in God's family and live like it, but there's a responsibility that comes with it. We're told in Matthew chapter 9 that when Jesus encountered the world, when he walked through those towns and villages and saw the crowds, the Bible says he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Matthew tells us that he said this to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out his workers into his harvest field. So when Jesus saw the lost, when he saw those who were under, under the control of the evil one, he didn't look the other way. He didn't cluck his tongue and shake his head in disgust about how can people live like that? He didn't think that it was somebody else's job to care for the lost. 
Their lostness touched his heart and moved him into action. So what does that mean for us? As Blackaby says in his book, you cannot be in relationship with Jesus and not be on mission. God has the world on his heart. It seems if we're Christ's followers, we should have the same reaction. First of all, like Jesus, we should have a compassion for the loss that moves us to action. And we can start anywhere, anytime. I have a friend of mine named Louis Weber. Louis passed on. He's he's with the Lord now. But he was a, a minister, a pastor of a church in Northwest Ohio. And I had served a church just seven miles down the road. In fact, I baptized Louis into the Lord before he went off to college and then became a pastor himself. But he had a really dynamic church in the town of Wauseon there in Fulton County. And uh, they were just growing leaps and bounds. And I attended church there one Sunday and afterward uh, a a deacon came up to the front of the congregation and said, all right, all those people that have signed up to go out to the migrant camps today, we're gonna meet here at one o'clock and we're gonna go out there. So make sure you're here, and that was all the announcements. So I went up to, to Louis afterward, and I said, Louis, what was that about? He goes, well, every two weeks, all during the harvesting season of tomatoes, because Northwest Ohio is famous for all their tomatoes. So uh, what we do is we bring a potluck dinner out, we select a migrant camp, and we go out to the migrant camp, set up uh, uh, four by eight tables, and we have a whole host of people, and we eat lunch with the migrant workers, We make sure we have Spanish-speaking people at each table to be able to communicate the love of Jesus we have and our love for them. I drove home that day a ruined man. You see, as I said, I was seven miles down there, down the road from that church, and I had preached at the Delta Church Christ for over seven years. Those migrant camps have been there for 100 years. I'm telling you, not one time in seven years that I was there did I ever even think about the people that worked at those camps. I drive by those buildings. I drove by those migrant camps. And my heart was not moved at all to think about what their experience was. And here was a church that cared about people other than themselves. Now that's what a church does. But what can we do as individuals? the neighbors we have down the street that nobody visits or talks to. There's all kinds of opportunities for us to reach out. One other thing about that church, I was there, uh, they have a great county fair called the Fulton County Fair down there. It's the biggest fair outside of the Ohio State Fair in the state of Ohio. So I'm I'm down there and Louis, it was on a Monday, he was talking about what had happened the night before. I said, what what, what happened? He says, well, the the county fair on a Sunday night shuts down at nine o'clock. I said, okay. He said, so we as a church, we bring out a whole meal out to, the, out to the county fair and we feed and host all the carnival workers. Now, I don't know about you, but carnies kind of scare me. I don't know. <laughs> but here they're bringing the dinner out to these carnival workers. And Louis said, one of the guys who's one of the head, head uh, carnival worker guys, one of the organizers, he said, We travel from town to town to town, and I've been doing this 20 years, and this is the only church in the only town that has ever done anything for us. You see what I'm talking about, about a mindset, about thinking about a responsibility to be involved in helping to win the lost? One other story, a man named Dale Krause was a member of the Kentwood Christian Church. Dale graduated from the University of Michigan, and he said, and this is what he said, I'm not making any comment, judgment, he said, any, any vestige of a relationship with God, and he, it was, he said it was a very weak one, but he said that was drummed out of me at the University of Michigan in, in the engineering field. He just was very much of an atheist and, and had nothing to do with the church. And he got a job at a conveyor belt company there, a Rapistan in Grand Rapids. And he was an engineer and he was doing very well, became the head of his department. And he said, there's always, there's two guys in the department that always, for during the lunch break, they'd bring their lunch and they'd sit over at their own desk and they'd be doing a Bible study and pray together. And he said, we used to just mock those guys. We made fun of them, Bible thumpers and whatever. And he said, one day after about three years of this, he goes, I went over to talk to them and I said, 
what do you guys do over here? He said, well, first of all, Dale, we pray for you every day. And he goes, oh. And we studied the Bible and so forth. And he said, what do you pray about that you'll come to know who Jesus is? About three, more, three years later, Dale was going through a real low time in his life. His marriage was really shaky at the time. He had really risen in the ranks, but felt that making more money and having the promotions, and still he was very empty. And he was really down. And he went over to those guys and said, do you mind if I sit down with you? They said, no, sit down. And those two men led Dale Krause to the Lord. Dale Krause then uh, grew, became an elder at Delta Church Christ, a trustee at Great Lakes Christian College, and his son, Tim Krause, is a missionary in the Dominican Republic. All because two guys at work, they, they, they weren't being, you know, out there and really being a pain in people's butt just because they're, they're Christians. He just, they really cared about other people. You see what, we can start anywhere, anytime, being kingdom people and caring about the lost. There's all kinds of things we can do. Compassion for the lost is what moved people to action. So here it is, kingdom people care about the lost. The second thing we need to do in response to first 519 is that we should be praying for more workers. Why? Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. I mean, he's very explicit. When my two boys were teenagers, one of their responsibilities was to mow the grass. I had to remind them of that responsibility often. But imagine my coming into the house to remind them of their duty and they say, but oh dad, you are so beautiful and resplendent. Let us reread the cards and letters you have sent to us and contemplate your love and wisdom in this air-conditioned room. Well, boys, the grass is getting long out there. But Father, let us instead consider your nobility, your dignity. We just want to sit here and discuss your goodness and be thankful we are your children in this air-conditioned room. Listen, you guys need to take care of your responsibility to mow the grass. But Dad, Dad, can we not stay here and sing your praises and really honor your wonderful name? To which any self-respecting dad would say, get off your butts and go mow the grass, right? Now, I give this illustration, folks, because we have churches full of people who seem willing to praise the Father, but fewer still who are willing to obey the Father. We're told that the harvest is plentiful. We're told to pray that there would be more workers sent out to bring the harvest in. The problem is not the big bad world out there. Again, we're told the harvest is plentiful. Understand this. We're talking about God's harvest field. It's his field, which means he's already planted the seeds. Listen. Listen, he's already planted the seeds. The soil has already been cultivated. The harvest is ready. The problem is having enough workers to get out there to bring the harvest in. And we are to be involved in the process. What our Heavenly Father is saying to us is, hey guys, get out there, it's time to mow the grass. The Apostle John says that we know we are the children of God and the world is under the control of the evil one. So let's make sure we don't put a period in the place of a comma. We have a job to do as God's children and that is to bring as many as we can into the family of God as well. The church is many things to many people but in the midst of being the church and doing the church, we need to remember our first priority. We need to care about the lost, pray for the lost, and bring the lost to the feet of Jesus. That is what kingdom people do. My son Jason, who I mentioned earlier when he was 16, grew up to be a very responsible and just a great Christian man. It's hard to believe that he's 49 years old, which makes me really, really old. But when his church, he lives in Birmingham, Alabama, when his church came to him and said, hey Jason, we want you to teach an adult Bible school class. And this is a church that runs about 3,000, big church, so it would be a big class. And he said, we want you to teach an adult class. And he goes, well, I, I will, but uh, to, to get ready for that, I, I need to go and study. And they said, well, how long will it take? He says, well, probably two years. 
So what Jason did, who was already, he has a master's in engineering, uh, he went and got a master's of theology degree. That's my son, there you go. That explains a lot about my son. But he went and got a master's of theology degree so he could teach an adult Bible class in his church. Anyway, I said, son, is that the only reason you did that? He goes, no, I wanted to grow deeper in my faith. Okay, that's good. I said, well, did you? He goes, no, that was the interesting part. I know a lot more about my faith, but I didn't grow any deeper. I said, here's what I found out, Dad. You grow deeper in faith by putting into practice what you already know. I went, you know what, that was worth two years of your life because there's churches full of people that never get that. They go to conferences and seminars and read books and do all kinds of things. Now there's no, no harm in going to conferences and, 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 and conventions and reading books, that, don't misunderstand me. But how you grow deeper is you put into practice what you already know. So here's the starting point as kingdom people. Realize, truly realize that we are all a part of God's family and then just live like it. Know who you are and then do what the Father's asked you to do. Put into practice what you already know and it's gonna be an amazing, amazing thing how God's gonna work in your life. So here's the challenge for kingdom people. To live like a child of God and to love the world like our Father God. When we do that, we become a model home for God's kingdom. We become a place that celebrates, that cares, and obeys. People, saved or lost, will want to be a part of that neighborhood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for the opportunity of speaking your word. Uh, it is an honor to me to be able to represent you in even this fashion. Father, you know my own heart and how far I still have to go in growing in my understanding of my place in your kingdom. But Lord, I just pray that through your Holy Spirit, not only myself, but all those in this place can come to a, a, a fresher awareness of who we really are as your children and what we need to be doing in a world that's under the control of the evil one. Father, thank you for loving us as you do. Thank you for being our Father. As I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.